Hey guys, what's cracking? Godsman here, coming at you with another top 10 list. Today we'll be completing our terrific trio of knights with the top 10 most impactful boss units in the Shadow Paladin clan. First introduced in BTO4 Eclipse of Illusionary Shadows, Shadow Paladins are the second of the three great Paladin clans. The power of the Shadow Paladin clan lies in its ability to sacrifice its allies to gain great power and various skills, a twisted use of the Paladin trademark to call units from the deck. Being piloted by the first antagonist and fan favorite character Ren Suzukamori, Shadow Paladins were an instant fan favorite clan with a strong following to this day for both the aesthetic and playstyle of the clan, as well as the characters associated with it. Initially released a little bit of success, Shadows quickly grew to dominance, overshadowing, pun intended, most clans in the game due to its superior fundamentals and devastating vanguard abilities. In today's video, we're going to take a close look at some of those vanguards, specifically the top 10 boss units which most impacted the clan's success, and discuss why these cards were so good. Before we begin though, I want to stress that these cards will not be judged purely based on strength, rather on the level of impact they had in their respective formats, as well as the longevity of their use. This is important, as the Shadow Paladin clan has more than their fair share of strong bosses, easily enough to make a top 20 in fact, so it will be their lasting contributions and historical significance as a card which will be of the utmost importance for today's list. Finally, I may sound a bit under the weather for this video, had no more time to record due to me moving soon, so I apologize for that, but I'll try my best to keep a normal tone. Now without further ado, let's begin. I hope you enjoy. So before we get into the list proper, let's discuss a quick honorable mention, Phantom Blaster Dragon. First released in the set VPTO2 Team L4, this V retrain came with the following two skills. First skill, act on the Vanguard Circle, counter blast and retire three rearguards. Your opponent chooses three of his or her rearguards and retires them. This unit gets 15,000 power and critical plus one until end of turn. Second skill, act on the Vanguard Circle once per turn. If your opponent has four or less cards in his or her damage zone and no rear guards, Soul Blast a Grade 3 and deal one damage to your opponent's Vanguard. Phantom Blaster Dragon is a rather fitting unit to begin with. Being the first boss unit in the original iteration of the clan, as well as its first real boss unit in both the V and D eras, PBD is an iconic and historic unit. That said, PBD was not historically good, competitively speaking, but it does give a good overview of the Blaster archetype, a version of Shadow Paladins that specializes in field control and deadly Vanguard swings. This is perfectly exemplified in PBD's skills, which mutually wipes the field and gains both a large power-up and a damage ping to pressure the opponent. Although it was a decent vanguard in early V era, PBD did not see much success in the meta, and as new vanguards were released, it seemed as though Phantom Blaster Dragon was all but forgotten. That is, until VBT-10 Phantom Dragon Aeon released, where the titular Dark Dragon would see a sudden surge in viability with the release of his very own Ride Chain, which came in the form of Freezing Witch Bendy, a grade 1 unit whose skill, Red, Act on the rearguard circle. If your vanguard is Blaster Dark, Soul Blast 1 and retire this unit. Search your deck for up to one Phantom Blaster Dragon. Ride it as stand, shuffle your deck, and that placed unit cannot use its act abilities until end of turn. This superior ride chain was a game changer that flipped the script for PPD, granting various benefits not just to Blasters, but Shadows as a whole. Of course, Blasters themselves did reap the greatest benefit from this, allowing the deck to cross ride into Phantom Blaster Overlord as soon as turn 3, which was the intention behind the clan's ride chain. But the ability to ride a grade 3 early came with a few benefits in its own right. First off, players could get a force marker as soon as turn 2, which in combination with PBD's twin drive and any potential grade 3 rearguards led to pretty solid early game aggression. This was especially devastating if the player happened to go first, as this meant they would be able to hit large numbers against a grade 1 vanguard. Furthermore, PBD's base power of 13k made it hard for grade 2 vanguards to hit it, only adding to the disparity of tempo. Not to mention PBD's status as a grade 3 vanguard helps speed up the conditions of certain cards like the aforementioned Phantom Blaster Overlord as well as Drag Driver Luard. Of course, the right chain was not without its flaws as it did require a fair bit of investment in the deck and heavily relied on you seeing your Blaster Dark for your grade 2 ride. However, that didn't stop the PBD ride chain from being a complete menace, as it not only gave V premium shadows an edge, but downright terrorized the premium format. This was mostly due to the new stride rules that were implemented in the premium format. See, originally, a player could not stride unless their opponent was on a grade 3 or greater vanguard, but the new stride rules changed this, allowing the player to perform a stride as long as they began the turn on a grade 3 vanguard. The Phantom Blaster Dragon ride chain made good use of this distinction, allowing you to consistently stride against a grade 2 should you go first. If that wasn't bad enough, this ride chain was also wildly consistent, with Skull Witch Nemain single-handedly guaranteeing you the ride chain by searching both Bendy and Dumpwood Dragon, who in turn searched Blaster Dark. For these reasons, Bushiroad eventually banned Freezing Witch Bendy, putting an end to this strategy. As it would so happen, 
the right chain would also fade away from V Premium despite the ban only applying to the Premium format, as the benefits of an early PVD ride simply wasn't worth the investment anymore, especially with the advent of Heal Guardians which neutered its early rush potential. So although it was only for a brief moment, Phantom Blaster Dragon finally became the blight on the meta he was always destined to be, deserving of an honorable or dishonorable mention on this list. And taking the 10th spot on this list is Shadow Paladin Sorcerer Supreme, Dragheart Luart. Released in G Trial Deck 10, Ritual of Dragon Sorcery, Luart possessed the following skills. Odd on the Vanguard Circle, Ritual 3. Active there are three or more Grade 1 cards in your drop zone. Choose two normal units from your drop zone and put them on the bottom of your deck in any order. At the beginning of your ride phase, you may pay the cost. If you do, until end of turn, you may stride without paying the cost the next time you stride. Auto on the Vanguard Circle. Counter Blast 1, choose one of your rear guards and retire it. During your turn, when your G units stride, you may pay the cost. If you do, search your deck for up to two Grade 1 or less cards, call them the separate rear circle, and shuffle your deck. Debuting at the onset of the G Next Era, Dragheart Luard was the progenitor of the ritual mechanic and somewhat revolutionized the clan upon release. See, during the G era of Vanguard, every clan received what was known as a keyword, a type of ability unique to a single clan which gave them some sort of ability or condition relative to the deck's particular strategy. Oddly though, not every clan received their keyword at the same time, with Shadow Paladins being among the last to receive theirs, leading to Shadow Paladins' first strider, Clara Sword Dragon, to simply fall back on traditional methods instead. Unfortunately, however, Clara Sword would be outshined by the likes of Revengers and Blasters, which both saw great competitive success and left Clara in an awkward position within the clan. And so came the advent of the Ritual keyword in Luard, entering Shadow Paladins into a new era which radically changed the way the clan was played. Traditionally, Shadow Paladin decks would burn through their resources liberally, allowing for hard pushes against the opponent. However, as seen with the likes of Blasters and Claret Sword, this method of gameplay, while very effective, was also high octane and easily depleted the player's field and other resources. Luard, on the other hand, was more resource conservative and opted for a slower, more stable strategy. This was in large part due to Dragheart's skill to strive without paying a cost. In the G era, one of the most limiting aspects of any deck was the need to discard three grades worth of units for the cost of stride, forcing the player to always hold on to fodder every turn. Should they fail to do so, the G zone would be locked out to them, resulting in a massive loss in tempo that generally saw most players losing the game or just scooping on the spot. This led to a very common predicament in G gameplay where players would often have to make difficult choices in order to retain their ability to access their strides. With Luard, however, the rules need not apply, completely eliminating the need to micromanage stride costs and giving the deck a massive advantage over most others. The ability to return units to the deck for this free stride was also highly beneficial, allowing Luard to return key pieces into circulation and in turn directly counter the typical Shadow Paladin issue of running out of units. Furthermore, not discarding a card for the stride meant that Luard's first skill was effectively a plus one in card advantage due to the triple drive that came naturally with strides. Another aspect that made Dragheart such an insanely stable strategy was its amazing second skill to call any two grade one or less units from the deck for the price of one. Not only was this another plus one every turn, but the white search radius of the skill granted you access to an insanely powerful toolbox which could fulfill any role you needed. Perhaps you needed an attacker unit like Night Sky Eagle or Swift Owl. Maybe you needed more units to retire. Cursed Eye Raven and Arsir were great options. And looking a little small, Blackwing Swordbreaker and Blau Owl filled that role quite nicely. Need more Counterblast? Abyssal Owl and Vikaru have got you covered. Soul looking a little light? Owl Owl is there for you. The Ward's possibilities for toolboxing were second to none and gave the deck the ability to do just about anything. And between the Ward's primary skill and the ability of several units to return themselves to the deck, there was little fear of not seeing what you needed. The only weakness that came with the ritual game plan was that it was somewhat slow, and the deck typically took a little while to get its ritual online and begin the cycle, making Luar builds rather vulnerable to rush decks. That said, that did not stop Luar decks at all from being a solid meta deck in the G Next Era, only being beat out by Juggernaut Tier 1 decks like ZTP, Blasters, and Bladewings. Overall, Luar ushered in the start of a new breed of Shadow Paladin, one that claimed victory not through sheer ferocity, but through unwavering stability and the near-limitless resources at its command. The sole reason Dragcar is not higher on this list is that everything else in this list either impacted the clan to a greater degree or, funnily enough, are evolutions of Luard himself. However, as the inception of the ritual keyword, Dragcar Luard was a foundational unit who set the stage for a legendary deck that would get progressively stronger with the later incarnations of Luard, which lie further along in this list and take the number 10 spot with ease. Moving on to the number 9 spot, we have Supremacy Black Dragon or Geyser Doomed. 
a stride unit which possessed a single skill which read, Act on the Vanguard Circle once per turn. Cost Counterblast 1, choose a face down card named Supremacy Black Dragon or a Geyser Dragon from your G zone. Turn it face up. Choose three of your rear guards and retire them. Reveal two cards from the top of your deck. For each grade one or less card revealed with this effect, choose one of your opponent's rear guards and retire it. Put the cards revealed with this effect into your hand. If the number of face up cards named Supremacy Black Dragon or a Geyser Dragon in your G zone is three or more, this unit gets critical plus one until end of turn. Released in GBT04, Orgeyser Doomed was the first boss unit of the Claret Sword archetype in early G, and a direct evolution of Orgeyser Dragon, which was released one set prior. What made Doom so impactful was the amazing value it granted to Shadows as a generic stride option. One of the greatest abilities of the Shadow Paladin clan is its ability to convert field presence into raw value, and Doomed was a hallmark of this very ethos. Now at first glance, it may seem as though its default counterpart Orgeyser Dragon would be better, as it only required two rear guards to gain its plus two, making it a net neutral versus Doom, which required three rear guards for the same two cards. However, remember that we're talking about value rather than just card advantage, and this is where Doom won out in the end. With the price of three rear guards, you not only gain two cards to the hand, but the opportunity to retire two of your opponent's rear guards as well, leading to a holistic plus one under ideal conditions. Furthermore, Orgeyser's removal skill just could not be underestimated, as it was one of the few control options in the clan that actually allowed you, the player, to choose the rear guard rather than the opponent, granting Shadow Paladins a great stride option to pick off problematic units. Another subtle difference is that while the original Orgeyser Dragon was an auto skill on attack, Doomed was an axe skill. This made Doom more convenient, as you could put forth fodder units to pay for the skill before replenishing the field with better offensive pieces, making the turn function more efficiently overall. These factors led to Doom ironically being a powerful first stride option, where players would often ignore the critical effect as ramping or geyser dragons in the G zone was simply not worth the hassle. Doom of course functioned great in its home deck to Claret Sword, but truly shined in Luar decks, which maximized the potential of Doom's skill with the help of Belial and Abyssal Owl to refund the cost, making Doom a fantastic way to set back the opponent while building both hand advantage and the ritual condition. Although past its prime, Orgeyser Doom was a pillar of utility that served as Shadow Paladin's first stride option for most of G, cementing the clan's ability to convert the board into great value. It makes ninth on this list. Striding in at number 8 is Drag Strider Luard, a stride evolution of Drag Heart Luard which possessed the following skill. Auto on the Vanguard Circle, Generation Break 2, Ritual 7. Choose two of your rearguards and retire them. When this unit attacks, you may pay the cost. If you do, choose any number of cards from your hand, discard them, and this unit gets 3,000 power for each card discarded. If the number of cards discarded is two or more, until end of that battle, this unit gets critical one, drive one, and your opponent cannot call grade one or greater cards from hand to guardian circle. Revealed in the last set of the G-Next format, Dragstrider was the highly anticipated boss unit for the ritual keyword, and stood as a symbol of the ward's growth and power throughout the format, being the finisher the deck desperately needed. As stated previously, the Ritual Variant of Shadow Paladins had a near flawless toolbox at its disposal, making the deck very versatile and hard to put down. Unfortunately, however, the deck did not have a solid win condition to work towards, relying on its superior attrition to win the day. The deck began with Drag Driver Luard and Carnivore Dragon, which did not fulfill this role, and Orgeyser Doom was mainly a first stride. It would receive Drag Ranger Ogma later in set 10, but this was a very situational card and simply not reliable enough as a win condition. This forced the ward players to outsource to the Diablo strides, that being Phantom Blaster Diablo and Spectral Blaster Diablo, for finishing potential. And while this worked fairly well, as these were admittedly pretty nuts, it was Dragstride Luar that truly broke Luar's ceiling with his ridiculous Guard Restrict. Guard Restricts, to briefly explain, are a type of ability which, true to the name, limits the opponent's ability to guard. These could range from minor annoyances to major threats, with Sentinel Restricts being one of the best forms of a Guard Restrict. Dragstrider Luar took this a step further by restricting all Grade 1 or Greater units, bear in mind Sentinels were Grade 1 starting this time, forcing the opponent to guard with Grade 0 units or G-guards. This was easier said than done though, as Luar's extra drive and power-up skill meant that the thing could get pretty big really quickly, thus asking for a ton of shield value to hold it off. Simply no guarding Dragstrider was rarely an option either, as the added critical and potential to drive check further criticals meant that every attack from Dragstrider was lethal. So while this unit demanded great sacrifice from your field and hand, it also demanded great sacrifice from the opponent to defend its ruthless assault. With Dragstrider in the picture, the war decks gained a veritable battering ram of a vanguard, with players actively building the deck to optimize the kill potential of this one stride. 
Achieving Ritual 7 was generally not an issue for the deck, and most games would see the condition met by turn 4 or 5. As for the cards in hand, Rot Triggers and repeated use of Blackwing Swordbreaker or Blau Owl gave you plenty to work with. But perhaps the greatest asset of Drag Strider was Cursed Eye, a stand trigger that returned itself to the deck from the rearguard circle to call up to two cards from the deck in exchange, providing not only potential fodder for Drag Strider, but also maximizing the chances of seeing a stand trigger in your quadruple drive check for multi attack shenanigans. This allowed the deck to abuse certain offensive pieces with multiple swings, such as Grosne, who was a massive beater, or Morfessa, who had a threatening on hit skill. When the GZ era rolled around, the Ward decks also got access to their most powerful Grade 2 in Drag Fencer Dagda, a card which could call two Grade 1s mid battle every time it attacked. On their own, these rearguard multi attacks would be annoying, but not necessarily game ending. But when the opponent had to commit their best guards to fend off Drag Strider, these additional rearguard swings would suddenly become very overwhelming. Interestingly, Dragstrider also happened to be generically viable, granting the whole of the clan a solid avenue for finishing off the opponent. Third Sword decks benefited from this greatly, as their propensity to call Grade 1s from the deck with Revolt and Helheim skills made Ritual 7 very easy to achieve, and necessary too, since it lacked a finisher native to the strategy. With this single stride, the end goal of Luard's Ritual was unveiled, that being a single devastating blow which allowed you to put your entire being to feel this all-out attack. Dragstrider was an amazingly potent unit that proved to be one of the clan's best game enders, only being beat out by a couple other stride options due to their greater overall impact to the clan as a whole. Still, it lands at a solid 8 on this list. And now galloping in at number 7 is Illusionary Revenger, Mordred Phantom. This is a V retrain released in the infamous set VBT-06 Phantasmal Seed Restoration, and possesses the following two skills. First off, Auto on the Vanguard Circle. When your Blaster Dark is placed on Rear Circle, you get an Imaginary Give Force. The second skill then stated, Auto on the Vanguard Circle. When it attacks, if your opponent's Vanguard is greater or greater, counter last one, stand all of your Blaster Dark, and they get 10,000 power until end of turn. The first Revenger of the list, this version of Mordred Phantom was released in the middle of the V era, to fair meta success, topping several BCS championships in 2019. However, it wasn't Mordred's tenure in the V series meta that put it on this list, but rather the nature of his card design that reverberated throughout the format. When it came to the downfall of the V Premium format, there were many gameplay issues which played a role, two of the most prominent among them being the excessive marker spam found in decks of the era, as well as the linear card design which usually boiled down to freestanding units for beatdown. Mortred Phantom embodied both of these attributes in V card design, generating massive quantities of force markers to beef up your blaster darks, which then swung twice each under these markers, gaining an extra 10k power to boot on the second swing due to Mortred's skill. Mortred decks also abused force markers in a different way, stacking them on a circle with Danger Lunge Dragon to capitalize on the card's Sentinel Restrict critical a la Drag Strider style. Be it blaster darks or Danger Lunge, these were some very hard to guard attacks. Mordred would later be ran in other decks, finding a place in Phantom Blaster Overlord decks as a strong finisher that used the pre-existing Blaster Darks present in Blasters. More recently though, Mordred would serve as the first vanguard for Revenger decks due to the release of Dragoon Phantom, a crossride specifically for the Dark Knight. Interestingly, Mordred also saw play in hybrid Revenger builds with Raging Form Dragon, as the force markers generated would make Raging Form's triple vanguard swings hit that much harder. It was blatant power creep, and more of a lazy card design, which set the precedent for future V retrains, particularly during the G-Boot era. The precedent of Mordred was so fresh that the community would token the term Mordred clone to describe vanguards which utilize these type of skills, especially rearguard restands. A good example of so-called Mordred clones includes Shaharot Vampir and famous professor Big Belly, units that relied solely on massive rearguard multi-attack to win games. Although it wasn't for positive reasons, Mortred Phantom nevertheless had a great impact on his home format of V Premium. So, for serving as a strong asset to multiple Shadow Paladin decks, and for being so iconically absurd that it led to the creation of the Mordred clone term in the Vanguard community, the Dark Knight rests his steed at 7th on this list. And now descending into the number 6 spot is my avatar, Revenger, Raging Form Dragon. A monster of a card, Raging Form possesses the following 3 skills. Auto on the Vanguard Circle, Limit Break 4. Use three of your rearguards with Revenger and its card name and retire them. At the end of the battle that this unit attacked, you may pay the cost. If you do, use up to one Revenger Raging Form Dragon from your hand, write it as Stan, then choose your Vanguard and that unit gets 10,000 power until end of turn. Second skill, Auto on the Vanguard Circle, Counter Blast 1. When this unit attacks, you may pay the cost. If you do, it gets 3,000 power until end of that battle. Third skill, Continuous on the Vanguard or Rearguard Circle, Lord. Now, the Revengers are a series of cards introduced in the Break Right era. This archetype focused on retiring its rearguards to gain very powerful abilities to overwhelm the opponent with. 
But whereas the blaster is specialized in field control, Revengers mostly forgo this in favor of the sheer ferocity of their skills, with many of their rearguards possessing devastating multi-attack abilities. So, the inclusion of Raging Form Dragon is for a very simple reason. The card was the first viable boss unit in Shadow Paladin's period. As stated previously, the Shadow Paladin clan was not initially a meta deck, or even good for that matter. This was due to the boss units at that time, Phantom Blaster Dragon and Phantom Blaster Overlord, having lackluster abilities which were rarely worth their cost. Instead, first generation Shadow Paladins had to rely on their ability to gain card advantage and the cross ride bonus of Phantom Blaster Overlord, which granted could be enabled early with Nightmare Painter, to win through sheer attrition. The Limit Break era did no favors to Shadows either, as the clan received little support due to it not appearing in the second season of the anime for plot reasons. Things were rather bleak for the fan favorite clan until the release of the Revenger archetype in Trial Deck 10, Purgatory Revenger, and then subsequently Booster Set 12, Binding the Black Rings, which released the boss unit of the archetype Raging Form Dragon. Raging Form completely turned the fortune of the clan around, finally providing the clan with a powerful vanguard whose skill was worthy of the sacrifice required. Being the first unit in the clan capable of multi-attack, Raging Form Dragon's Limit Break provided access to a frighteningly powerful attack which not only gained 10k power, a significant boost at the time, but also had a few major advantages over other vanguards which possessed multi-attack. For one, Raging Form's second attack retained the Twin Drive, setting it apart from the other noble vanguards like Dragonic Overlord and Spectral Duke Dragon. Raging Form Dragon was also exceptional in that it did not care if its attack hit or not, which made it harder to play around compared to previous meta contenders like the End and Dragonic Descendant. And unlike all the units mentioned in this comparison, which demanded multiple counterblasts, Raging Form didn't require any for the reride, making it free in that regard. The aforementioned 10k power up was also beyond that of previous restanders, and in combination with Mortured Phantom's break ride, meant that both attacks were demanding a minimum of 15k shield per attack. All told, this made Raging Form Dragon the most ferocious vanguard multi-attack in the game during the Break Ride era. Now of course, Raging Form also had a couple weaknesses, most apparently being his reliance on seeing another copy in hand, rendering the card useless until then. Another issue was the limit break cost requiring specifically Revenger units, making the card not play well with outside support. Aside from that though, this card ruled. Even the 3k power-up skill of RFD came in handy, as this, with the 7k booster, made a 21k column, which is a magic number. With Raging Form Dragon at the helm, Revengers became one of the best decks of the entire Break Ride format, contending with the likes of Chaos Breaker Dragon before passing off the torch to Phantom Blaster Abyss in the Legion era, a topic we will return to in a moment. And the viability of Revenger of Raging Form Dragon is iconic and emanates well past its time as the V-Series version also puts Revengers into a solid rogue option in both the V and Premium formats. Not to mention that, of the time of releasing this video, the premium deck set for 2024 features the OG Raging Form prominently. Be it the past, present, or future, Revenger Raging Form Dragon remains the face of the Revenger archetype, representing a very significant period in the history of Shadows and becoming a trailblazer which ignited the clan's inner potential into an unstoppable wildfire in the meta thereafter. It takes the sixth spot on this list by a mile. But the Revenger train doesn't stop there. Manifesting at the number 5 spot is Revenger, Phantom Blaster Abyss. This is a Legion unit released in Extra Booster 11, Requiem at Dusk, with the following skills. Act, Vanguard Circle, Legion, Blaster Dark Revenger Abyss. Second skill. Auto on the Vanguard Circle, Counter Blast 2, choose 3 of your rearguards for Revenger and its card name and retire them. During the turns of this unit Legion, at the end of the battle that this unit attacked a Vanguard, you may pay the cost. If you do, stand all of your Vanguards. This ability cannot be used for the rest of that turn. Auto on the Vanguard Circle. When this unit attacks a Vanguard, this unit gets 2000 power until end of that battle. As I alluded to in the previous entry, Phantom Blaster Abyss was the card that succeeded Raging Form Dragon as the principal boss unit of Revengers upon entering the Legion era of Vanguard. And this card improved on Raging Form Dragon in almost every way possible, surpassing it not just in power, but also in competitive success, becoming arguably the most successful Legion in the history of the game. So what made RPBA so good? Well, in the nutshell, it was the most powerful Vanguard multi-attack in the game, capable of swiftly dispatching the opponent in a single turn. Remember how Raging Form was topped here because of the power, twin drive, and lack of a hit condition? Well, RPBA had all these things going for it too, while also possessing its own advantages. Fundamentally, RPBA was superior to RFD in that it was a re-standard rather than a rewrite. This is important as it meant Phantom Blaster Abyss could double dip any trigger effects placed onto it, a benefit Raging Form sadly lacked as rewriting the Vanguard would make said trigger bonuses disappear. Of course, rewriting would later become much more worthwhile with the release of imaginary gifts, but I digress. 
As a Legion unit, Phantom Blaster Abyss possessed a massive body for every attack, being an easy 22k attacker without other boosts, making it cumulatively hit harder than ever before. In tandem with the Mortred Phantom Break Ride, this meant RPBA was coming in at the opponent for a minimum of 32k each attack, which was extremely large for the time. It did not lose the Twin Drive ability either, a key element of pressure to the opponent. This in particular compounded with the Legion mechanic to return triggers to the deck, making the unit's double attack all the more threatening when stacking triggers onto it. It also did better advantage-wise, not requiring a copy of itself from the hand to perform the multi-attack. Overall, a much more potent vanguard despite the added counterblast and need to religion every turn. This impacted Revengers massively, literally taking the strategy to the next level as the deck to beat throughout all of Legion era, most especially in the English format. This was due to another jumbling of the set releases which saw Extra Booster Requiem at Dusk released on November 21st to 2014, preceding BT-16 which released major contenders like Thinksaver Dragon and Prominence Glare. It was in part for this reason that RPBA swept the English Nationals in 2014, making it the top deck of the format. This wasn't the only claim to fame RPBA had though, as it combined with Thinksaver Dragon to form the Tier 0 Thinksaver Abyss deck that trounced everything else the format had to offer. If that weren't enough though, RPBA would push Revengers to be the best Shadow Paladin deck until the introduction of Diablos, being one of the seldom few viable Legion decks in the G era, only truly falling off of the introduction of G Guardians. So for pushing the Revenger deck into the meta dominance in the Legion era and keeping it viable well into the G era, Revenger Phantom Blaster Abyss made waves in the clan and takes fifth on this list. At number 4 is the greatest Shadow Blaster unit ever conceived, Dark Dragon Phantom Blaster Diablo, a stride retrain with the following skill. Act on the Vanguard Circle once per turn. Counterblast 1 and choose a face down card named Dark Dragon Phantom Blaster Diablo from your G zone to in turn it face up. If the number of cards face up in your G zone is 2 or more, until end of turn, this unit gets 10,000 power, critical plus 1, and the following skill. Auto on the Vanguard Circle. Choose 3 of your rear guards to retire them. When this unit attacks a Vanguard, you may pay the cost. If you do, your opponent may choose 2 of his or her rear guards and retire them. If 2 rear guards were not retired, your opponent cannot call cards from hand to guardian circle until end of that battle. Coming out as the boss unit of the very successful Ren Suzugomori Legend deck, Phantom Blaster Diablo immediately warped the metagame of the G era, becoming the most powerful stride in Vanguard at the time upon its release. And how could it not, as this single card completely broke the format, once again turning Shadow Paladin into the clan to beat. As we discussed with Dragstride Luard, Garb Restricts are one of the most powerful abilities in the game, being a winning strategy for a multitude of decks throughout the years and Phantom Blaster Diablo possessed one of the most powerful guard restricts ever created, one that denied virtually all forms of guarding during early G. Now at first glance, there would appear to be a glaring weakness to this card, as it only gets the guard restrict if the opponent is unable to retire two rear guards. Simple enough, right? That is, until you remember one of the aspects of Shadow Paladin's game plan is retiring the opponent's rear guards. Blaster Dark Diablo retires a unit on stride for Diablos. Blaster Dark Revenger Abyss gave Revengers their own retire skill and the later released Death Spray Dragon gave every version of Shadow Paladin generic retires during the battle phase. This in turn forced the opponent to invest a lot of rear guards to the field in order to safely avoid the guard restrict. Consequently, however, that would exhaust the opponent's resources in the process, making them vulnerable to death anyway due to a simple lack of cards in the hand. Phantom Blaster Diablo was a catch-22 unit that disrupted the very way the game was played, forcing the opponent to maintain a full field at all times or risk losing on the spot. And being a generic stride, every Shadow Paladin deck in the game had access to this nigh unguardable vanguard by simply investing two spots in the G zone. In order to address the rising level of power in the format and the menace that was Phantom Blaster Diablo, Bushiro released the G Guardian mechanic, a form of guard that not only had high defensive value, but also bypassed most guard restricts since it was called from the G zone rather than from the hand, making it a viable counter to the Dark Dragon. But unlike RPBA, which fell off completely due to the G guards, Phantom Blaster Diablo still continue to see play as an option in most Shadow Paladin G zones. After all, not all G guards are created equal, and while G guards could in theory bypass the guard restrict, many G guards were not powerful enough to single handedly defend against the 36k Phantom Blaster Diablo. Though striding it against an opponent who foolishly committed one or less rear guards would still oftentimes put them in a tough situation where they had to blow their valuable G guardians to stay alive. And this ability to demand the opponent's G guards is what keeps Phantom Blaster Diablo relevant. In fact, even in the modern premium metagame, the card continues to see fringe play in G-Zones to this very day as a way to catch the opponent off guard and punish strategies which don't commit to the field. 
So for its role in necessitating the release of the G Guard mechanic and continued contribution to the Shadow Paladin repertoire ever since its release, Phantom Blaster Dragon Diablo snags the fourth spot without question, only being beat out narrowly by the next three cards on this list. And rising from the darkness to the number three spot is Dragfall Luard. This sinister evolution of the iconic Dragheart Luard possessed the following skills. Continuous Vanguard Circle, Ritual Cross. You may pay Counterblast 4 and choose a normal unit from your drop zone and put it on the bottom of your deck. This cost is reduced by Counterblast 1 for each Grade 1 card in your drop zone, as the cost for Stride and Ultimate Stride. Second skill, Odd on the Vanguard Circle, Counterblast 1. When your G unit strides, you may pay the cost. If you do, search your deck for up to one Grade 1 or lower card, call to the Rear Guard Circle, and shuffle your deck. If that unit has the Ritual ability, choose one of your opponent's Rear Guards in the same column as that unit and retire it. So Dragfall here released in the infamous GBT-14 Divine Dragon Apocrypha, the final booster set of the GZ era. Now, the GZ era of Vanguard is a rather unfortunate period in the game's history, suffering from rampant power creep which abruptly ended with the reboot of the entire game with the V-Series remake, formerly referred to as standard format. GZ represented the twilight years of the G era, releasing a myriad of units which dramatically upscaled the power level of the format to an untenable level. Dragonfall Luard is an interesting case, however, as on paper the card doesn't seem to be a direct upgrade to Dragheart Luard, but rather an alternative strider. Why is it so much higher on the list than Dragheart then? Well, that's because the areas where Drag falls ahead were more advantageous in the premium format and allowed the deck to survive the transition to V-Series power creep. To understand the success of Dragfall, we first need to understand the landscape of the premium meta. Premium, we briefly explained to new players, was created after the 2018 V reboot and is a format where cards from all eras of the game are playable, excluding those on the restriction list, of course. V-Series presented an immediate upscale in power even compared to GZ in many ways. V-Series Vanguards possessed base power of 12 or 13k, which was greater than the 11k of GZ Vanguards, trigger units had extra shield value, and potentially worst of all, the power boost of said triggers increased from 5k to 10k. This in combination with the new imaginary gift mechanic, which was insanely powerful, led to the vast restructuring of most decks in the game, where they needed to include their clan's V-Series support in order to keep up with the power creep. The ward, however, remained strangely unaffected, slowly including some V-Series units like Morion Spear and Blue Espada to be sure, but still relying on Dragfall the ward as the main vanguard of the deck despite its lower 11k base. This was in large part due to how reliable Dragfall was as a strider, and held two critical advantages over Drag Heart. First off, its main skill to stride for free was much faster, allowing you to access free striding and ultimate striding as soon as turn 3, whereas Heart had to wait until turn 4. And speed was key, as most V-Series units were capable of doing their plays on turn 3 too. Dragfall's second key advantage was its second skill, which gave the deck the ability to play through control decks by calling to an empty field. This also came with a retire skill which proved to be quite nice because, as discussed with Orgeys or Doomed, retire skills which let you choose the target were hard to come by in Shadow Paladins, giving the deck its own element of control while directly countering other control decks. Now admittedly, Dragheart did still see some play, and some Luar players valued Dragheart's more long-term game plan to Dragfall, and in fact, both would often see play together to varying ratios. However, Dragfall was far more reliable because it could be taken into unknown metagames and not be punished as hard by rush strategies or control decks. Because of this, when the two were ran together, Dragfall generally had higher ratios than the original Dragheart, exemplifying its greater premium viability. As far as successes go, Dragfall Luard helped to keep the deck alive in the premium format, keeping it viable throughout the years as a rogue or tier 2 deck which saw occasional jumps in success, such as winning 2018 Texas over Anj the Wall, very impressive, or Karan Patel topping BCS Illinois in 2019 and subsequently winning 2021 BRO in the EU region with it. This coincided with major releases such as Drag Principal Morfessa in 2019 Premium Collection and the Wave of Shadow support in the Team Dragon's Vanity set. Dragfall Loire proved to be an incredibly tenacious deck, holding an absurd level of longevity in the clan. Even though it may not be topping in 2023, the deck hasn't completely disappeared and could very well resurface in the premium metagame. Although not a top dog in most cases, Dragfall did achieve something virtually no other strider could by keeping Shadows around the premium metagame, and making it stand out for its stay power of the years and thus one of the clan's most impactful boss units ever. It takes third on this list. And taking the silver on this list is Drag Principal Morfessa. This stride evolution came out in V Special Series 1, Premium Collection 2019, and has the following two skills. First skill, act on the Vanguard Circle once per turn. Counterblast 1, turn a card from your G-Zone face up and retire two rearguards. 
draw two cards, and until end of turn, you regard trigger units in your drop zone as grade 1. Second skill is Continuous on the Vanguard Circle, Ritual 10. All of your front row units get 15,000 power and critical plus 1. When your opponent would call cards from hand to Guardian Circle, he or she must call two or more at the same time. Orfesta's entry on this list should come as no surprise, as the card has been the clan's best finisher to date, surpassing previous entries on this list for how much it raised the bar for the Hall of Shadows. Interestingly, Orfesta somewhat combines the abilities of various Shadow Paladin strides. It converts field advantage to hand advantage like Doomed, a massive power and a critical and a guard restrict like both Phantom Blaster Diablo and Drag Driver, and even extended this power up to the front row rear guards like Drag Abyss Luard, a card that nearly made this list too, being deposed by Morpheus as the best finisher in the entire clan. And this has been the case since its release in 2019, bolstering the entirety of Shadow Paladins with a ruthless offense that only got worse with the multi-attack options at a clan's disposal. Bacta was a prime example of this, calling a call on the grade once from the deck to further dip into the Ritual 10 effect. And since Dacta was not a once per turn, it could activate its skill again when restood by its stand trigger. This very tactic is what led to Dragfall winning the aforementioned 2019 and 2021 events. But Morfessa was great in more than just Luard, and served as the final stride for various Shadow Paladin decks, be it Blasters, Revengers, or Claret. One of the best things about Morfessa was how simple the card was, enabling Ritual 10 easily with its first skill. Once the opponent was at 4 damage, it was pretty much game over as everything gained a critical in Morfessa. And as it would so happen, Shadow Paladins had access to several strong stand triggers like Cursed Eye Raven and Arsur which put themselves back to the deck, making it very likely that more rearguard swings are in order. The sheer combination of abilities just added up to make this card a force to be reckoned with in the premium format, giving all decks that added lethality to close out games with ease. So for being the Shadow Paladin finisher of choice upon its release three and a half years ago, Morfessa will take the number two position on this list. And finally taking the top spot on this list is the one and only V Dragheart Luard. This is a V retrain which dropped in VBT 10, Phantom Dragon Aeon, possessing the following two act skills. First, act on the Vanguard Circle once per turn. Retire two grade one rearguards. Draw a card, choose one of your opponent's rearguards and retire it. Second act skill, on the Vanguard Circle and once per turn as well. This ability's cost is reduced by Counterblast 1 for each grade 1 card in your drop zone. Counterblast 3. Return two normal units from your drop zone to the deck. Search your deck for up to one Drag Driver Luard. Write it as stand. Shuffle your deck. At the end of this turn, write a Drag Heart Luard from your soul as stand. The other piece of this puzzle is Drag Driver Luard, which also possesses two skills, starting with Continuous in the Vanguard Circle. During your turn, this unit gets 5,000 power for each of your Grade 1 Rear Guards. If you have two or more Grade 3 cards in your soul, the original critical of all your Grade 1 Rear Guards becomes two. Secondly, Auto on the Vanguard Circle, when placed. Counterblast 1, search your deck for up to the number of cards in your soul with Luard in their card names plus one Grade 1 cards. Call them to Rear Circle and shuffle your deck. So in actuality, this should be a dual entry as Drag Driver was just as important to the strategy by providing the payoff to Dragheart's setup. However, I chose V Dragheart as it's his ability to ride Drag Driver and ability to re-ride from the soul that put everything together. Anyway, V Dragheart and Drag Driver were both released at the height of the Jibu era, which as explained in the Gold Paladin video was a time in V Premium where the meta was constantly shifting from one set to the next, and at a rapid rate. Dragheart was no exception, in fact, he was the prime example immediately taking the meta by storm upon release. So why does Dragheart take the top spot of this list? Well, in addition to being a tier 0 deck on release, which still sees competitive play to this day, mind you, Luard is regarded as one of the most meta-breaking decks that almost killed the game, leading to a real-world controversy due to how strong the strategy was. See, shortly after its release, Dragheart Luard was twice restricted with Skullwitch Domain, one of the clan's most powerful grade ones. But this wasn't just any restriction, but rather an emergency restriction, which was incredibly rare and unexpected. Unfortunately, it was so quick and unexpected that most shops had already invested in domains only for them to plummet in value almost immediately and without warning. This led to a lot of shops no longer selling Vanguard product in their stores, dealing a big blow to the game of Vanguard, which had lost the trust of many store owners and thus their business as well. This isn't the only thing Luard would be remembered for, however, as in just a few sets after its release, the game of Vanguard announced its second reboot. As a result, many in the community pinned part of the blame on Luard's dramatic meta dominance, saying that Luard had quote unquote killed the game. A sore sentiment to be sure, but one with an incredible amount of stay power, leading to concerns when the stride deck set for Luard was announced for D Standard, once again claiming that Luard had come to kill the game. 
These worries would prove to be unfounded when the deck released only to fair meta success, but it still goes to show how embedded Luart's impact was on the V format and on the community itself, acting as a sort of boogeyman for some. But beyond community superstition, V Luart was still an absolute powerhouse, as the deck would see prolific meta success to this very day. The biggest asset of V Luart lies in its ability to generate mass quantities of force markers, with three markers being obtained on turn three by riding Dragheart into Drag Driver and then back into Dragheart at the end of the turn. Every turn after this would grant a minimum of two additional markers due to this ride switching. That made Luard one of the most effective force marker generators in the entire game, being a challenge only by the likes of Mordred Phantom, Majesty Lord Blaster, and National Poets. That isn't all though, as these force markers generally went to the front row rearguard circles, where said rearguards gained a critical due to drag driver's effect, leading to absurdly large columns with extra damage. If that weren't enough, Cards such as Drag Wizard Morfessa, Apocalypse Bat, and Abyss Router could all be comboed to enable further multi attacks with these same power buffs. Despite being released in 2020, Luard remains a behemoth of the deck, receiving tops in the V Series metagame even three years later. The Drag Heart has also seen some premium success, being a rival to Dragfall builds due to its access to Force Markers and Swift Beatdown. It's an absolutely legendary unit, one that represents the pinnacle of achievement in the Shadow Paladin clan, standing atop all others as the most impactful boss unit in Shadow Paladins. And that was the list. Shadow Paladins have had an interesting journey in the history of the game, where despite its lackluster start, would go on to be perhaps the most meta successful clan of all time. Despite not usually being the best deck of the format, Shadow Paladins are consistently viable in just about every format they're in with the Revenger and Luar decks being the clear two favorites among its many archetypes. But even when it doesn't take the spotlight, the Black Fang of the Shadow Paladin clan will continue to bite from the darkness, menacing all the clans of Kray. Anyway, if you like this kind of content, then let me know what other top 10 lists you would like me to do. Next up is Oracle Think Tank, a clan that sadly lacks a robust competitive history, but still puts forth some very strong units worth discussing. But that's for next time. So if you have any comments for this list, or perhaps suggestions for the OTT list, then let me know down in the comments section below. Trust me, I read them. In the meantime, check out my other videos. I do top 10 videos like this, fight nights, cheer lists, the whole shebang. And if you like what you see, consider leaving a subscribe and troll notification bell for the next time I upload a video. And with that, take care, and God bless.